1918, a lawyer and his friends were sent to prison by a military court for a crime of insurrection. These men were released from an Atlanta penitentiary to the New York suburb. Today, it is claimed that in the 1930s they hired machine guns to protect them from intolerance at a New Jersey public gathering. Is this a real problem? Did this really happen? If it did or didn't, can we find the real truth about the Watchtower team? Intolerance, machine guns, and the Watchtower? This question was sent to us by one of our viewers, and they were asking us to look into this story about Rutherford and machine guns. And a book review was sent on demythologizing the legal history, Jehovah's Witnesses and the First Amendment. Was there, was there anything in particular our, uh, the viewer wanted to know about this subject? Are there photos? Does anyone have more to the story? That's an interesting uh, pick for a topic from a viewer. Usually it's more um, doctrine oriented that you've gotten emails, we've gotten emails for, but I like this. This is once again, history and going back into things. So in this book review, there's a sentence here that says, at one convention, Rutherford had the stage surrounded by machine guns in order to protect himself from the Catholic hierarchy. At another, he had special lookouts on the roof watching out for airplanes sent by the witnesses' enemies to bomb the building. What's the story? The first one is almost believable, but to think that the, even a government back then in, in this country to bomb buildings because of him is kind of a little far-fetched, maybe even a little paranoid. If he believed it, unless he was just trying to stir up media attention. Yes. I didn't think airplanes would bomb a building in our... U.S. military planes would bomb a building at that time, especially in this country, over him. Well, that's the start of that second paragraph, right? This paranoid thinking extended to the legal dimension. And the doctrinal yeah, dimension. Well, where did that all come from? Again, we've said this several times before on the channel. This paranoid thinking came from this whole reconstruction of a new doctrinal and prophetic scheme by Rutherford and his friends that made everything so egocentric to themselves. All prophecy was about Watchtower Society after 1914 and especially after 1919. And, and when all the nations come against Jerusalem to battle in those prophecies, of course, the Jehovah's Witnesses apply that to themselves. So they have this, they have this paranoia that at some point in the future, everyone's coming after them. And their entire doctrinal scheme is based on that particular subject, mm -hmm. on that particular interpretation. So this story originates out of one of the bulletins for Jehovah's Witnesses. This one happened to be December 1st, 1933 issue. And like everything else, Rutherford liked to use the things that happened to him, the things that happened to the Bible students, but specifically the things that happened to Rutherford himself, and he would use those things to his advantage. This proves we're Jehovah's organization because look at what they're doing to us. Jesus said there would be persecution, and we're the only ones being persecuted. Except they're not the only ones being persecuted. It's that paranoia mentality again. The stirring speech on religious intolerance delivered by Brother Rutherford at Plainfield, New Jersey before machine guns and a house full of strong-armed Ethiopians with glistening revolvers is to be broadcast throughout the country on Sunday, December 31st. There are hundreds of radio stations and portable transcription machines going to carry this very important lecture on that date. This message is the most pointed and clear-cut declaration of the Lord against the institution of Satan, particularly the Catholic hierarchy, delivered up to that time. We believe that this will make a tremendous impression throughout the country and be very instrumental in causing many to don their garments, manifesting where they stand in the great issue. Now, what city did this take place in? Plainfield, New Jersey. 
Okay, so there were in in Plainfield, New Jersey, not only were there warplanes, there were machine guns, and there were also armed Ethiopians. In there, where did that one come from? That that that's a that's an interesting one. Where where did the what at the time was there some Ethiopian gang somewhere in New Jersey going on doing something? Because that that is even odd for for this. Do you know or? I, I, you know, I thought New York was the dangerous place, but Jersey. <laughs> I, I yeah, I, I I grew up down in that area as a boy, and I never recalled hearing of horrible Ethiopian gangs and, and anything like that. Um, I, I I don't know where that one came from personally. I wonder if it's a racist comment. Possibly. Uh, it's some kind of derogatory statement. Notice he put it in quotes. So. Mm-hmm. It's typical of, of the Rutherford era, how he describes those that are against him. This story was also published in the Golden Age of January 31st, 1934. Where was the world in 1933 in regards to the war or history? World War II didn't start until 39. Mm-hmm. Hitler was just coming to power in 33. He wasn't even on the radar as much then as he became later on, especially in the later years. Wasn't he elected chancellor in January of 33? It was early on. Yeah. Well before, well before 39 and all, all that came to fruition. And then he slowly with Mein Kampf and and through his, his works gained control of the socialist political party. And yeah, so that was well before the war. He, he set some footwork. And we know Herbert Hoover of the FBI had a file on Rutherford. Uh, we have some of that file in, in our documentation. So Rutherford was being followed. But what was the instance here that caused this this issue? That's, I, I don't have the answer to that. <laughs> I, well, you can't answer everything that they've done. I mean, you could point to the facts and what surrounds it, but you can't always find a reason for why they have done certain things in the past or will do so in the future. This is also in the middle of the Great Depression. There would have been a lot of people out of work, a lot of very hungry people, and looking for some type of message. Rutherford was trying to deliver a message to prove they were the one true church, the one true organization that Jehovah had appointed, and this persecution mentality, this persecution complex, was right up his alley. He he knew how to advertise, advertise, advertise to use those kind of situations to his advantage. At a certain point, the radio stations got tired of his diatribe and they just stopped allowing his uh, allowing him to buy radio time in order to uh, proclaim his hate uh, filled speeches over the public airwaves which is something that they don't talk about it's it's all the presentations given but not okay, we don't want to hear it anymore, and we don't like what you're saying. And it's even controversial. And and religion and and Bible truth, the controversy it's it's supposed to stir up is not a hatred controversy and us against them. It's a a question of, of who's right to rule. Is it Jesus' kingdom or man? And that that can be done peaceful while people are not liking you at the same time. So he, his method of, of public dissemination of his views were, were, were questionable. But he did it purposely because the things that he did or the things that happened to them made the news. And they made sure that it made the news. Because if it gets in the news, that's free advertising, right? Right. And it it puts them on everyone's radar. So the April 1st, 1939 Watchtower gives a little bit of the story here. And it says, September 1st to 29th, 
1933, a special campaign by Jehovah's Witnesses was carried forward, in which they distributed a large amount of literature exposing the scriptural denunciation of the religionists, the Roman Catholic hierarchy. For Rutherford, everything was the Roman Catholic hierarchy at the time. Even as a boy um, in, in the 70s uh, growing up, I remember my grandmother, they were very proud of the announcements they gave and, and what they said against the Catholic Church in particular. Um, they fixated on the Catholic Church. Um, and also, as the article states, um, in there, Joshua's orders were carried out exactly as giving. They're putting them in a position where they are the new Joshua, the new anti-type uh, of, of the type. Yes, and that, again, that was Rutherford's scheme again to prove, hey, we're the chosen ones. And by the way, I'm the one taking the lead of the organization, so I'm the chosen one. Back to that sheep and goats discussion that we had. And they take the things that happened to them and they start applying it to various Bible stories and saying, hey, that's a type of us. And it proves we're Jehovah's chosen organization. Of course, most of those types have been dropped. And even a few years ago, they stopped. They had an article saying that they stopped using types. I think they realized that that just doesn't work. What I thought it was those types that made them chosen and, and passed over for inspection. That's another discussion for another time. Jim Penton, while he was still a Jehovah's Witnesses, wrote a book called Jehovah's Witnesses in Canada, Champions of Freedom of Speech and Worship. And he talks about this. In July, he released the booklet Intolerance in relation to the New Jersey situation after having delivered the text as a public talk, also widely broadcast at Plainfield, New Jersey, while police machine guns were pointed at his back. In order to carry Rutherford's message as contained in Intolerance, and in a similar booklet, The Crisis Throughout the United States, some 12,600 American witnesses volunteered to invade unfriendly communities by the hundreds to contact people in every home. Late in the year and early in 1934, these same door-to-door -door preachers and many others circulated a petition vigorously protesting against Catholic intimidation and threats of freedom of speech over the radio. So again, Rutherford used the story to his advantage and pushed the followers more to press the message, thus infuriating the public and causing more persecution and more things to happen to them, proving that they're the chosen organization because they're being persecuted. He's creating a new story almost purposely. He could have, for, yeah, for that matter, he could have even chosen the American government instead of the Catholic Church and riled the people up, and they would have thought the same thing. They're attacking us, you know. So it's not just, we're not just trying to talk about the Catholic Church. We're, we're trying to point out that they could have created any obstacle or persecutor to go against them and a lot of people were just followed and believed now this is the new type and once again this is what caused all this and there are many who believed it they they followed him in droves uh, it seemed logical to some but you know some are afraid to question and and he created an atmosphere where you couldn't, you couldn't question. question it yeah and so if you'd kept your mouth shut and several years go by, several generations, that's how you get from Rutherford's era to where we are now. And that that persecution mentality still continues, but so does that control where public questioning, you know, something here doesn't quite logically make sense or doesn't look contextual from the scriptures, something doesn't fit here. What if we look at this from another way? You can't do that. It, it, now, now in, their, in their defense, not, not to say, you know, give a good um, rapport on some of the stuff that Rutherford and the witnesses did at that time, 
um, it is well known, pretty well known, that they were quite champions of Supreme Court decisions for rights for people and freedom of speeches. And a lot of this had to do with what he was doing back then. Um, it wasn't popular, a lot of it, because back then it was wartime or pre-war time or watching coming from war, watching a war that is going to happen in Europe. And we didn't have the, the technology and the surveillance and the, the means to conduct a reconnaissance and all that. Back then, it, it was more foot. It was people. There were spies. There were um, Russian agents and interference in, in the government. The 007 of Plainfield, New Jersey. Like back in World War II, when Japan was going, uh, we were going to war with them, there were claims of using carrier pigeons and all kinds of stuff to the California, to, to the West Coast in contacting the larger Japanese population to find out, hey, what are, what are the Americans doing? What are their newspapers saying? So when they were going anti-war and going all this against everything America stood for and was, was paranoid for, it wasn't a message of peace. It was a message of dissension in, in reality. There is an excellent book called Judging Jehovah's Witnesses that looks at a lot of these cases that the Jehovah's Witnesses fought in the courts in order to get their freedom to preach. And they did uh, amazing in winning the majority mm -hmm. of those cases. And they changed the landscape of uh, the courts through the work that they did. Do they do it because they were patriots? Do they do it because they love the United States? No, they did it because they were looking out for themselves. It benefited America, I, th I think, but I think it was a selfish motive. And that's even open for a discussion whether it benefited or <laughs> did not. But we'll talk about that <laughs> another time if you want. <laughs> the booklet that he wrote on the subject was Intolerance. And you can see in the Jehovah's Witnesses and the Divine Purpose history book that was done in the 50s. They have a little a thumbnail of that. And they mention here again, as he walked onto the platform, he saw that the police had two machine guns behind the drapes. Now it's two. So <laughs> didn't quite mention the number before. These machine guns were so placed that they would be forced to speak directly in front of them as they were trained on him and the audience. This made Judge Rutherford extremely angry, but his vigorous protests failed to budge the police or their guns. They said that they had been tipped off that there was going to be a riot, and they were there to maintain order. But regardless of what their intentions might have been, the talk was delivered without incident and enthusiastically received, as was the booklet Intolerance, later published and widely distributed. So in, in 1933, they didn't know how many machine guns there were. But years later, they were able to determine how many they were. And they said that they got tipped off that there was going to be a riot. So they were there to protect Rutherford and the audience. I thought they were there because they were against Rutherford. Yeah, let's go on and read a little bit further, right? So here's Rutherford's side of the story in the booklet. The chief of police, a Roman Catholic. The Roman Catholic hierarchy, right? Just because the chief of police was a Roman Catholic. Tried to prevent this meeting from being held. On the day before the speech was to be delivered, a number of Christian men and women were distributing small handbills announcing a time and place of the meeting. This they had a perfect right to do. As there is no ordinance in Plainfield and no other law that prohibits such distribution. Besides, it was done for the people who might wish to come. Without any lawful right or excuse, the distributors of these handbills were arrested by police officers and thrown into jail. Shortly thereafter, police officers near the jail were heard discussing the matter of the distribution of these announcements that Judge Rutherford would speak the next day at the Strand Theater and one was heard to say to another, he will be here tomorrow and he will get what's coming to him. 
So now this is hearsay. He's publishing in the in the booklet. He's publishing hearsay. Now, he, here's a fact. Okay, the Catholic Church at that time did protest against the Jehovah's Witnesses. They did. There, you can't question that. But once again, let's ask the question: Why were they doing that? What instigated that? Well, if they were just going out passing pamphlets of their belief, nobody really would have bothered them. But when you're singling out the Catholic Church, well, now they're going to react and have a reaction toward what you're saying against them. Um, if I, I had an opinion about something, you would allow it. But if I had that opinion toward you specifically, I don't like it because Jeff is doing this, this, you'd be, hey, wait, this is why I do it. So the Catholic Church in defending them in this is they, they really didn't instigate the fight or, or the conflict between them. Did they respond accordingly? Yes. And there are stories of Jehovah's Witnesses being tarred and feathered around the yeah. country. Um, but if they weren't causing a conflict, nobody just would have went out and said, hey, he's a Jehovah's Witness, let's tar and feather him. So they brought, and once again, advertise, advertise, advertise. That makes the paper. You know, everybody wants to read about why someone's being tarred and feathered. <laughs> Yeah, <laughs> I mean, if it happened today, I, I every day. Right? Yeah, yeah, exactly. When you see that, it's like, oh, what'd that guy do? <laughs> so th there's reasons for all this, and we're not picking on Jehovah's Witnesses, nor are we picking on Catholics, but we're going to put it in a fair light. And this part of it wasn't included in the Insight books and all the other the Divine Purpose. Uh, it was more or less instigated by the Jehovah's hey, back Witnesses. To, back to the booklet. He, he gives more of the story. Here he says, Two hours before the time for this meeting to begin, armed policemen began to arrive at the theater. No one invited them to come, and no request had been made for any police protection, and, now, and none was needed because it was a peaceable assembly for the discussion of the Bible, for, uh, the discussion of the Bible matter, which the Constitution of the United States guarantee shall be held without interruption. Manifestly, at the instance of cruel religionists, these law officers were there, more than 60 in number, armed with heavy revolvers, sawed-off shotguns, riot guns, and other instruments of destruction. Just before the beginning of the lecture, police officers made an effort to provoke Judge Rutherford to a controversy, with the manifest purposed of finding some excuse to prevent the meeting. But in this they had no success. When Judge Rutherford stepped to the front of the platform to speak, he was literally surrounded by armed men as though he were a desperate criminal. With guns in the back of him and in front of him and on every side, he delivered the speech which you now are about to read. The judge of the court who had conducted the farce trial and who at the time had indulged in cruel and improper speech toward the defendants and who had defamed the name of Jehovah by his public declarations was immediately in front of the speaker and was compelled to listen together with the officers who were doing the bidding of the Roman hierarchy. So now we have a lot more than two machine guns that are mentioned in the other article. Why does the story keep changing? And to an extent it almost looks like they're creating another mini Cedar Point Ohio event like this was a, an important event that that took place um really let's say it did happen let's say they were there it's common at concerts at, at other rallies and different things for the police especially if they believe others might come and instigate your peaceful protest so they they very likely were just there hey look you know this could get out of hand if other people show up let's have some police there j just to cover up so it wasn't a specific in my opinion and i'm going to say it's my opinion i don't think it was a specific act against them as much as maybe let's prevent a riot from getting out of control yeah and that's how the divine purpose book explains the story they were there to protect rutherford and and protect against a riot that's not what it says there it's not what it says here <laughs> there's a, a complete different story that's exactly it's only a couple decades apart right 
So yeah. then, which which one are we supposed to believe now? Exactly. Where was he being protected, or was there a riot? What, what's what's going on? I'm glad you asked that question because there are some Jehovah's Witness historians who discuss this in their book. Uh, Bruce Schultz and Rachel Devin in their separate identity, volume two, Organizational Identity Among Readers of Zion's Watchtower, 1870 to 1887, volume two, Culture and Organization. That's quite a mouthful for a title. This idea that Rutherford had the machine guns comes from Stoop's book. And so Bruce and Rachel's idea here in their preface, uh, page 19, says the charitable view is that Stroop was a careless listener. He took from conversations what he wanted, ignoring their real content. The far less charitable view is that he did as elsewhere in his book. He just made it up to suit his agenda. We know from his footnotes that he read most, if not all, of the available Watchtower booklets, though he cites them by chapter name and not their proper title. Rutherford's booklet, Intolerance, describes fully what happened, and then that's what we had read. Stroop would have found this available at the meetings he attended, along with the other publications he acquired and read. Instead of protecting Rutherford, the officers were there to intimidate him and Watchtower adherents. And while there were two machine guns, they did not line into the theater. Wait a minute, didn't, didn't that Jehovah's Witness and the Divine Purpose book state that they were there to protect them? Now they're... And then it changed again. At one point there was one in front, one behind, then there were two behind. So there, there were... There were several around, sawed-off shotguns, revolvers, and pistols. And Ethiopians. <laughs> so, uh, his, his conclusion is the entire story, the entire story, as told by Stroop, is unethical, inaccurate, and meant to mislead. When we look at the several times that the story is mentioned... The story keeps evolving even within the Watchtower literature itself. So it, it, it's interesting that you have to put all these stories together to get a full picture of what happened. But how do you do research? I think you've got to look at primary sources. Not so so what, what is the primary resource in this instance? I'm glad you asked. So in this book review that was sent to us by our listeners, it's quoting from Stroop's book. And it's mentioning that it comes from a uh, note 27 and note 29. So if we go and look at Stroop's book, here's the pages that are quoted in this book review and in that other book. The book doesn't say that Rutherford had the guns placed there for his protection, only that they were there for his protection. Stroop isn't exactly clear what he's saying, so I think it could be read to understand that the police had guns there to protect Rutherford. But the spin that it's put on from the story and this telephone game is it keeps going from one book to another book. It keeps changing, not only in the history books that are against the Watchtower Society, but also we see the story changing when the Watchtower Society itself repeats the story. So I, I think this is the, sp the spin that this story puts on both sides of it makes it interesting. Very, very interesting. So in one aspect, it's for protection. Another aspect, it's for antagonized. Yes. I think the whole point of why we decided to look at this is because there are so many different stories told about the Watchtower Society from within the organization and without. And you can look at the history books, you can get various takes on it, but unless you go to the primary sources as as close as you can as possible, you can't get the full story and you got to look at all sides of the story. I know that a lot of the Jehovah's Witness materials they can't look at apostate material. So they it would be difficult for them to look at Penton's book, Apocalypse Or, or, Delay, or right? so-called claimed apostate material. Yeah. Not, so, not apostate material. Um, that, that's open for reasoning and discussion on that. I, I, a, I will not claim... Point. That's a good point. Yeah, I'm I will not claim that. somebody wrote an apostate book. It, if they're telling the truth, what's apostate about it? Right, I, I, that's a very valid point. As much as possible, gather both sides of the story. That's true for ex-Jehovah's Witnesses, that's true for Jehovah's Witnesses. That's true for those of us who are neutral and in between. We've never been a Jehovah's Witness, so, you know, 
if you can get the primary sources, the documentation, if you can get both sides of the story, put them all together and try and get the whole facts to the story. Primary sources is the key. I think that's the lesson of this story. If this story was so important and so big, why is it not mentioned in any newspapers? I wasn't able to find even one. If there are any out there, just please let us know. It would be interesting to see something to as close a first-hand account as possible. Like many things, Rutherford took something small and exaggerated it to make a point. We saw this in the Sheep and the Ghost discussion, where Rutherford basically said, it's all about me. Here he does exactly the same thing. So are you going to answer the question, who's right? <laughs> <laughs> I, I think, you know, Stroop's book, which is quoted by this other book, that's having the book review that mentions this story, it's, it's that telephone game. So I, I think the Jehovah's Witnesses and the Divine Purpose book is probably the closest to the truth. I don't think it's as exaggerated as the, the story Rutherford put out. I th early on, they back off of that story. And remember, in the early 50s, when they did this book, they would have, there would have been people who would have been there. And so they could have given a more first-hand account of, of the story. So it looks to me to be the most accurate. So I, I'll chalk one up for the Jehovah's Witnesses on this one. I think that particular book presents the closest to the story. Your opinion, Paul? I don't know if I can give a full opinion on it. Um, there's just too, too many versions for me to say, okay, Jehovah Witness one is right. No, this guy's right. There's just too many versions. I, I, I'm going to stick with the telephone line one on this one. That there might have been guns present where they... And it, the whole thing got blown out of hand. That, that's what I really think it is. And they made an event out of something that was just the police were there at like they are at every other event. And they turned it into a Cedar Point moment. Yeah. And th that's my take on it. And I think that's where I would fault the Jehovah's Witnesses. Why take, na why take the story now and make it a type and say, here's a Bible story that prophesied that this was going to happen to us. And this is what... Mm -hmm. Th this is what happened, and here's the Bible story that proves it, proves where his organization, that's taking it even a step further. So if you're already prone to exaggeration by applying prophecies to yourselves, how can we trust that primary source when we know it's already prone to exaggeration? So when they tone the story back a couple decades later, it's probably closer to the truth than way the way it was repeated to begin with and the way it's turned into something completely different by some of these watchtower historians well yeah. let's thank the uh the viewer who suggested this we wouldn't have probably picked this on our own and we probably wouldn't have done it at a suggestion unless it caught our interest and and we thought it was um odd so th this was a very interesting side note in in the the group Thank you, Jeff. Thank you, Paul. And until next time, keep reading. Thank you again, Paul. This has been a very fascinating discussion. Thank you all for watching. Like and subscribe. Leave some comments. Let us know what you'd like to see in the future. Get a whole story, not just from the Watchtower's perspective, but from all the various splinter groups. What, what were they saying? So until next time, keep reading.